Today's kit build is assisted by Moon Lake Dark Ale from Farmery Estate Brewery in Nipawa, Manitoba. There seems to be a growing trend of not having tasting notes on the cans. All they say on the side is the alcohol content and who they are. I guess if there's no tasting notes on the can, I have to do it myself. That's malty, a little bit sweet, not too hoppy. I like it. Not quite as dark as I was expecting from a dark ale, but there you go. So today, it's another kit build. As I mentioned, my kit build box is starting to get full. So I will just grab this guy off the top, which I think is one that I've received quite recently. So there's no guessing what this is. It says right there, it's a DDS signal generator. DDX means direct digital synthesis, which means that rather than the frequency being generated by an oscillator or something, it is being generated directly out of a microprocessor or a microcontroller. The waveforms are either directly sampled and recorded in the microcontroller or synthesized within the microcontroller using mathematical functions and then output at a wide variety of frequencies, which is a little bit different than a direct analog synthesis, which uh, has some limitations to the frequencies that it can generate. Although there are ways of getting around it with just banks of components and whatnot to uh, get different ranges of frequencies. Doing a bit of digging, I was able to find this article from over a decade ago, where this guy who, again, is not named as just admin from this website, um, he has come up with this project, which as I look through it, uh, there's the specs. It uh, can generate sine waves, square waves, sawtooth waves, reverse sawtooth waves, triangle waves, ECG, which I'm going to have to look up. I'm not quite sure. And uh, different noise uh, patterns. It has a uh, 16 by 2 LCD, five buttons. It, it can adjust the frequency in single hertz steps or 10 hundred thousand or 10 kilohertz steps, which is kind of nice, presumably for the menu. There is a block diagram. We have an AVR microcontroller in the middle, keypad, LCD, three voltages worth of power, an R2R, which is a resistive network to do the digital to analog conversion, and then an offset and amplitude adjustment, which I'm assuming is that little chip that I just picked up off the bench. The one that I have doesn't come with a power supply, and this is the suggested power supply that he has. I'm going to do something a little bit different because we need three voltages. We need a plus five to run the microcontroller. We need a plus and minus 12 volts to run the amplifier, which I'm going to assume is an op amp since it's got that. Um, where's our schematic here? Yeah, it is an op amp down there. Okay. And there is the full schematic of the thing, which... Again, just looking quickly at the circuit board I've got in front of me, that looks exactly like it, or close enough anyway, that we can refer to this one. We have an 18 mega 16 P. We have this R2R resistive ladder here, which I'll jump over to the Wikipedia article in a minute. We have a crystal, which is clocking that and becoming the reference for it. We have some push button switches. We have the LCD connections up there programming there although we're not going to do that because i'm hoping it's already programmed and then we have the op amp down here which is connected to the output of the r2r ladder buffering and amplifying it and sending it out oh and it looks like we've got an, a level adjustment there too okay cool so just to quickly look at what we've got in the kit although we kind of saw that on the schematic we do have an 18 mega 16 there we have a tl082 uh, dual op amp there we have a good old 16 by two LCD, the same kind that comes in a lot of the Arduino starter kits. This one doesn't have the I squared C backpack on it. So it's going to be connected through, I think it's a six or eight pins, something like that. Um, but that shouldn't be a big deal because we've got lots of pins on this microcontroller. And then we have a bag full of other components, uh, all the resistors for the ladder, two different, uh, resistances of them a couple of random other resistors two bnc jacks for the outputs we have a couple of potentiometers uh three potentiometers and some well, tactile switches some header pins a couple of capacitors there is the crystal that clocks the thing it's a 16 meg crystal as expected 
and a few just random bits of hardware and some header pins and stuff. For as much as this guy is doing, it's not that complex a kit to put together. A beginner shouldn't be too intimidated by this. So I'll just get my board set up in my board holder. You don't absolutely need a board holder. It just makes it much more convenient. For years, I just worked uh, flat on, on a workbench surface, and that was fine. But this just makes it so, so much easier. So where should we start? I think I'll probably start with resistors like I almost always do because they are low profile. They're almost impossible to damage. They generally don't get in the way of anything else. And most of them are actually crowded together. And I'll start with these individual orphan resistors back here and then carry on to the uh, ones for the R2 RO adder. And I'll explain that R2 RO adder thing in a second once I get to it. But first, let's get these other resistors sorted out. Someone who's not colorblind could probably use the color stripes on here, but me, I'm going to use my meter. This is a 100 ohm resistor, and that goes right up there. 12K, 12.1K, where do you go? Down here in the bottom. Should I go and look up what functions these ones are doing as I'm putting them in, or should I just do this and go for it? I think I will f just put this first batch in and then uh, go from there. These last two were bundled together, so I'm assuming they are the same, and that is 100K. 100K is these two over here. Soldering with the medium tip that I will prefer to use. Something that always seems to come up in the comments is that people who prefer a different tip will definitely be letting me know that I'm doing it wrong. As long as it works for you, it's not really wrong. If it doesn't work for you, then there are plenty of other shapes and sizes of tips that you can use. Size matters if things are really, really tight, you want a smaller tip, but generally a medium sized tip like that of any shape that you prefer is the one that's going to be right one for the job so that being done let's grab all these resistors there's two different uh, values here a whole bunch the same of each kind so this main mass of 20 k's and 10 k's is what makes up this r2 r adder and basically they are connected from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pins, eight GPIO pins of the uh, microcontroller here. And they are in a series parallel voltage divider kind of a system to allow basically for a digital to analog conversion. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds and the theory of this because that will just sidetrack the video and make it far too long. But there is a good Wikipedia article, which I will, of course, link to below, which explains it. But here is how they are laid out electrically. Um, along the top here, we have our, our digital outputs, our GPIO outputs from the chip. Um, ground on one end, we have V out on the other end. And it just works out to be a mass of series resistors um, going to there and series parallel resistors set up all the way along that each, so basically each bit each output of the gpio would add a specific voltage level to the output to create the final output voltage if you want to figure it out further there's the math help yourself that's as deep as i'm going to get into the theory of this might as well start with the 10 k's for no reason other than they're the ones that i've got in my hand and those ones all go down here, except for this 120K at the end. So I'll drop all those in and actually probably solder them up. Then I will drop the 20s in and solder them up. You'll probably get a montage video of these just because it's the same thing over and over and over again. And I don't have much more to say about it other than, other than that.
Once again, I failed to remember that I always get in my own way when I put too many components in at once. But those are all in there. And I've got one 20K resistor left and an unpopulated space for a 100 ohm resistor there. Right, let's carry on. Let's just ignore that for now and start putting in the next uh, components, which I've got some capacitors back here. A little bit hard to read. Those ones are marked 22 and those ones are marked 104. Two of those guys and three of those guys. There's a pair of 22 picofarads uh, that are just loading the crystal, the ET Mega. It looks like those go underneath the uh, chip socket. Hmm. Then there are the two of the 104s and there's two more over there. Hmm. Is there another one back there somewhere in the component world? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I've got everything. Cool. Still missing that one resistor, but I can deal with that. So I'll drop these guys into their spots and then I think I'll probably carry on with well, chip sockets. I'd like to leave the crystal till later on in this in the uh, project, but we'll see what happens. It's a little bit better for spacing of components to keep them out of my way or keep me out of my own way here. So next, I think I'll put this potentiometer up there, which is this one, and then. Maybe chip sockets, I think, next. Uh, I'll leave the switches till later uh, and the connectors and whatnot till later just because they may be in the way of what I'm doing. It's labeled 103, which is 10 with three zeros after it, otherwise known as 10K. So that goes right up there. And that one appears to be connected between a couple of pins of the... Uh, of the LCD, so that's probably going to be the backlight dimming, if I had to guess. Let's grab the female header pins that are for that LCD, put that up there. I also have to put some male header pins, where are they? There they are, on the back of the LCD to make it go in. As is often the case when I'm doing something large like this, uh, this female header pin uh, socket thing. I will just jam some blue tack on there just to hold it from falling out while I flip the board over. And then because it is a big multi-pin thing, I'm going to solder one pin at one end of it. And then give it the old reach around here and give it a press down tight to the board. Okay, that's not going anywhere. Then I'll go to the far end. Do the same thing there. Clamp it with my finger, remelt the solder, push it to the board, there. And now you can see that there's no gap back there. It's all held nice and straight. Now I can just bang along here and get the rest of it soldered down. As I tend to do with large multi-pin things, I'm going to bounce around with the heat, just so that I don't melt the plastic of the connector on the back by concentrating the heat all in one place, all at the same time. I also do that with uh, chip sockets, with chips themselves, if I happen to be soldering them directly to the board. There, that worked fairly well. I don't see any solder bridges or other untoward blobs. For getting the pins to sit straight on the back of this, I am going to plug the, uh, the pins into a breadboard here. This one has been beat up by soldering on top of it, so I'm not concerned about that. So I'm just Make that nice and square and get busy soldering down these pins. And every time you see my iron dart off screen for a minute, I'm heading over here to clean it off. Just brushing it off in a damp sponge and then giving it a quick scrub in the brass or copper or whatever this, uh, this stuff is just to keep it nice and clean so you get good heat transfer and uh, make a nice quick clean solder joint. So that is ready to go on there later when we need it, but that is not for now. 
I think the next thing to do is probably get this chip socket. I might as well do both chip sockets, I guess. So the silk screen shows the a little notch on the end of the chip position there, indicating that pin one is at this end. You notice that uh, that pin is a different shape uh, pad. That's not always the case, but in this case, that also indicates pin one. And then on the socket, there's a notch there. And on the chip, there's also a notch there indicating that that is the pin one end. So since that was shipped in a foam block, I'm going to hope that it's not too badly bent. It just drops right in if I get it lined up properly, just like that. Oh, and it's a nice tight fit too. I don't even need the blue tech. Excellent. So once again, I will do exactly what I did with the header pin. I will do one corner, reach around, push it, clamp it tight to the board, squeeze, heat, melt, good. Diagonal opposite corner, same thing. Solder on there, reach around, push, heat, ouch. Try that again, push, heat, good. Now that is solidly and tightly down to the board and I can quickly zoom around and solder it all down. Again, bouncing around so that I don't melt the plastic of the socket. Now I'll repeat for the 8 pin socket which is marked as either an LM358 or a TL082 and the TL082 is the one that was included in the kit. So again, notch down there, square pad for pin 1, notch at that end. And that one doesn't hold quite as tight, so I will give it a little blob of blue tack just until it's staying in place. There are various different ways of doing that too. You can use Kapton tape, you can use some kind of a mechanical clamper holder. I like this stuff. It's cheap, it's easy, it's quick to deal with. It's not too messy, although occasionally if it does melt, just let it cool and you can kind of pick it up with uh, just by blobbing another piece of it on top and it'll pick up any stray bits. I guess I will put the crystal on next because um, I've done with all the soldering up in that corner of the world so I don't think I'm going to do any heat damage to it. As previously mentioned, it's a 16 megahertz crystal which is fairly standard for the uh, 18 mega chips. Crystals aren't all that fragile to heat, unless you get the extreme on it. They can be a little bit fragile when it comes to mechanical stress. If you've got long leads on them, you may want to be careful when you're cutting the leads off. Um, but in this case, I don't have to do that, so that's not a concern. Now then, that one 100 ohm resistor that I couldn't find, I'll just grab one out of my stash here always good to have parts on hand you never know when you're going to need them that is a much lower water resistor but that doesn't matter in this application there's very little current going through anything in here as long as the resistance is right and my box says it is right so we'll go with that so next i think i will put the two potentiometers on there the board says that one's 50k and that one's 1k, 102, 10, and two zeros. 50k is 50,000, just like the board asked for. In this case, to hold them in, and just to be different, I will use a little bit of Kapton tape. Again, another useful consumable to have around your shop. So it is good for all sorts of electronics related applications including this one, although this is not exactly what it's designed for, obviously. I guess next let's put in those push buttons. Up, down, left, right, start, reset. So those guys just snap in there. The leads already have a little bit of a bend in there, so in them, so they hold in quite nicely. Let's get them all dropped in and solder them quickly too. Well, the only things left are these two BNC connectors, uh, which are output. 
that one's marked HS out or high speed out and that one's marked DDS out or uh, direct digital synthesis out. So there's four places to solder these ones. These two here are the connection. Um, that is just a shield ground. That is the actual signal. And these two are just mechanical. They're going to take some extra heat. So I'm going to want to be a little bit more careful with those when I'm soldering them so that I don't accidentally do some damage to something. And those I think I will solder the signal connectors first. There's the ground on that one and on this one. The grounds even take a little bit more heat because they are on a ground plane on the board. The signal of that one and the signal of this one. And now the mounting pin. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Just gonna give it a bit of a ow. Squeeze in a bit of a remount just to make sure it's solidly down. It is. And now this guy. Good. There's something I'm going to do on this one that I very, very seldom do, and people call me out for it all the time on these kit builds. I am going to clean up the flux on it just a little bit. That was some isopropyl alcohol. This is a dollar star toothbrush. It doesn't make it work any better, but it does improve the aesthetics for those who are concerned about it. Uh, some of the older types of flux that nobody uses for electronics anymore may have been a little bit acidic, a little bit uh, corrosive. Modern fluxes have much less concern for that. But some people like to see it, so there you go. Before I throw the chips in, there's a little bit of mechanical stuff to do. There's a couple of standoffs here for holding this guy, so I will throw them onto the board before I get too carried away. And then we will plug in the chips. There is our op amp. I'll get him in there. Actually, just first make sure that the pins are all straight. Not that I need it, something this fancy, but I will use the fancy pin straightening machine that Larry made me. I, he sent me that for my hundredth mailbag. And actually, come to think of it, is that the same Larry that sent me that whole big bunch of stuff for my two hundredth mailbag? I think it is. Dude, you are such an awesome supporter of the channel. Anyway, I'll plug that chip in there, making sure that I put the notch where the notch needs to be to line up properly. Punch him home. Yay, good. And then the same thing with the AT Mega 16. Although that won't fit in there so I'm gonna to have to just verify the pins man manually and I see that one of them is slightly out of alignment so I'll just give it a little titch there and hopefully that should be good now that my notch is at that end on the socket and this end on the chip what I'll do with this big guy if since I don't have any way of aligning it other than just by eye I'll gently set one roll of pins in, make sure they are where they need to go, but they're not seated yet. And then I will give the whole chip a little bit of a pry towards there until I can just get the pins on this side clear. You see how they should all drop in and they're all in line. And then put even pressure and just push them all down. And double check that none of them bent out of the way. I think we're good to go. Let's put this guy down on his pin header. Those screws line up. That is awesome. There, I think we are complete. Don't really need those nuts on the potentiometers unless I put it in the case, which I may do eventually, but not today. Oh, I think I'll set that one its midpoint because as I suspected it is for the uh, for the backlight on here so we'll just set that like that make sure there's no bits of metal on here now we need some voltage because I need three voltages and I need the plus and minus I'm going to use this tick station mini power board that I was sent for review a long time ago all right I think we're ready 
Power's all connected. Power on. Hey, hey, it's doing a sine wave. Cool. So let's see what these up and down, high speed, noise, frequency step, ECG, I don't know. Reverse sawtooth, sawtooth, triangle, square wave, sine wave. So up and down chooses from them. Right and left. Oops. Uh, hit the right button. That steps it up. That's the left steps it down. Start turns it on and off. And the reset button reboots the processor. Okay, let's connect a scope probe up to this thing and just see what it looks like. So right now I've got a 6K square wave turned on there. And just adjust the amplitude a little bit. So there we go. I think, is that measuring that as a 6K square wave? 5.997K, close enough. And if I adjust the amplitude, yeah, that works. What is this offset? Was it the DC offset? Uh, what else do we have here? Let's change that to a, well, let's go to a sine wave. Yeah, look at any sine wave. Oof, that's ugly. Doesn't look like any sine wave that I've ever seen before. Uh, let's freeze that. Wow, yeah, that is a very rough approximation of a sine wave. Wow. Let's see what these other ones are. What well, square wave we saw. How about a reverse sawtooth wave? Um, yeah, that's not really what I would expect of a sawtooth. Regular sawtooth. Look the same triangle wave on. Not really a triangle wave. I mean, there's a few bits there, but I mean, yeah, if you squint hard enough, maybe. All right, significant time has passed and significant amounts of troubleshooting have been done, but I found my error. You remember way back many minutes ago in the video, hours ago for me, I uh, discovered that I didn't have a 100 ohm resistor and I had an extra 20k. Well, the 100 ohm resistor is the one I have in my fingers and I found that I had accidentally soldered it into this position here, which is where a 20k should go. The resistor in question is this 20k right here. And I had replaced it with a 100 ohm resistor for reasons. I don't know. I don't have an excuse for that. If you want to scroll back in the video and find it, go right ahead. But anyway, so that was causing this GPIO here to overwhelm pretty much everything that was happening up here. And that's why I was getting such a goofy trace. So I have pulled that one out clearly and replaced it with the actual 20k that it was supposed to be. I'm just going to leave that spare 100 that I put in there just because. But now it works. So now if we power this on with a sine wave, we see on the scope an actual sine wave. A rather dirty one, but a sine wave nonetheless. And you see that it is showing as uh, 100 kilohertz. We change this to a square wave, we have a square wave, we change it to a triangle wave, we have a triangle wave, a sawtooth wave, the reverse sawtooth wave, and this ECG, which I figured out, it looks like a heart monitor. I don't know why you'd want to generate that, but if you need it for a special effect or something, there it is. And the random noise, which isn't completely random as you can see if I freeze the thing but it is noise nonetheless and the amplitude knob does what it's supposed to do actually let me get back to a different wave here sine wave there we go um, and the offset changes the DC offset of it I've got the scope in AC coupling mode if we couple it into 
and put it in, oops, put it in DC coupling. You should see that move around now, which can be useful as well if you need to bias an input uh, closer to ground or closer to um, the power rail or put it right in the middle. I'm not sure if I explained it super well, but here are the waves that it makes up the sine wave out of. There is a square wave at just the fundamental one kilohertz frequency. Then the next one, you can see has two different uh, pulses at different uh, duty cycles. This one adds an extra one and another extra one and another extra one. Let's just freeze that so you can see what it looks like. So it just adds all these together at different amplitudes, different percentages, and that is how it generates the sine wave output. And it's always going to be a little bit noisy, but if we zoom in on that ripple, we'll see it's about 400 to 500 kilohertz thereabouts, which is pretty close to the power supply ripple frequency. If I was using a much more smooth power supply, that would be a lot less obnoxious. But we do have a working uh, function generator, signal generator. So that could come in handy. It's uh, probably as clean as any of the other you know, DIY level uh, units that I've got around here. It's certainly good enough for audio frequencies. Um, although if I had a smoother, cleaner power supply that wasn't a switching power supply, it would probably give me a nicer output. Well, that was a bit of frustration uh, with my dumb mistake. Um, I think if my eyes did colors better, I would have been able to spot that a lot sooner. Regardless, there it is. Hope that was uh, interesting, informative, not too frustrating for you. Thanks for watching. I will talk to you later.